You're listening to the SmackDown Rundown on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Welcome, welcome to the SmackDown Rundown. Yes, yes, it is I, the one and only Nikolai, and I am your host for the show, and I am joined once again by my co-host, King J. The King has arrived. And you know what? We have a lot to cover this week. We just had the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view this past weekend. We've had... News stories breaking out. We've had a lot of things happening since we are now almost at WrestleMania. The last pay-per-view on the road to WrestleMania has finally come and gone. A lot of developments are coming out. A lot of changes might be made. Before we get to all that, King J, I have to ask you, what did you think of the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view itself? I didn't get to watch it the night that it happened. I ended up watching it, I think, yesterday on my phone. That's not easy to do. <laughs> that's, that's pretty impressive to watch it on your phone. Yeah. I mainly focus on the SmackDown portion of things. Um, overall, the pay-per-view was good. I really enjoyed the um, Elimination Chamber match. The Big Show versus Alberto Del Rio match was good, minus that botched in Zaguri. Um what other match did I watch? The Divas match should have never happened. Uh, um, I watched a little bit of The Rock versus CM Punk. It was okay. It was better than the last match that I had. And I absolutely loved The Shield versus Team Cena. That was a good match. Yeah. Um, for me, I thought the pay-per-view started off really hot. It was really good. And by the time... The Shield were on. That's where everything... Uh, that's where the, the pay-per-view climaxed for me. Uh, the Shield six-man tag match was awesome. The Elimination Chamber match was awesome. After that, the pay-per-view just went downhill. I, I Like I said, I enjoyed every match up until then. But when the Divas match came around, and I wasn't having high hopes for it. I was just hoping it would be at least decent. No, it was a disappointment. And the main event, Rock versus uh, CM Punk, it wasn't better than their Royal Rumble match. I'll just say that right now. I did not enjoy the match itself, but I love the story that they had going for it. Um, where C- CM Punk was trying to get The Rock disqualified, make him disqualify himself, or be so angry that he disqualifies himself, or everything else. Like, the story of the match that they tried to tell was there. The wrestling was not. Yeah, I think you summarized that perfectly. For me, it was what they were doing with the story versus the wrestling, because obviously that match, there was very little to no wrestling. Like There was more wrestling involved in the Divas match that was awful. And I'm not trying to sit here and blame either one of them, because I know that they're capable of doing better. I don't know what the hell happened. But the two of them shouldn't wrestle again. And we saw this uh, months ago. Me, you, Sierra, a bunch of other people on the network, we've all talked about this. Tamina and Caitlyn should not face off against each other. And if they do, it was they should not have done it this soon. This was not good. It was very clunky. It was all over the place. It had no rhythm, no flow. Caitlyn is beaten down the entire match, hits one spear, and wins the match. There was no story going into this, and there was no story, no wrestling, no excitement. And I hate to call it a piss break match, but it it was more than that. It was a nothing match. You, you didn't even have to do anything for it. You can go to sleep during this match. You can do whatever you want. It has no qualification of any specific title. It should have been a non-match. That's how bad it was. Yeah, because I wasn't sure if I was going to get to watch SmackDown this week because... I'm still on location, on vacation, so I watch when I can, and I read the spoilers for SmackDown. I'm like, okay, well, I have to watch this match. 
so I can talk about it leading into what happened on SmackDown. And SmackDown was far better than what the hell that match was on the pay-per-view. Oh, yeah, definitely. But uh, before we get into SmackDown, I want to talk about the World Heavyweight Championship match from Elimination Chamber. Um, Del Rio finally over came the big show, made him tap out to the cross arm breaker. This was an awesome match. Very, very good match to start the pay-per-view. Yes, folks, you heard me. It started the pay-per-view. Shouldn't be surprised anymore because that's what the World Heavyweight Championship is all about now. Curtain jerking. Although, when it starts the pay-per-view, it starts off hot. And this is what this was. Yeah. What are they going to do with Big Show now? That's a very good question. From what I've seen... Since Elimination Chamber, first of all, was he even on Raw this past week? Um, no. No. Well, he was on WWE Main Event this week, and he came out, well, we, what else would you expect him to do? Whine, bitch, complain about not winning the match. And uh, he basically challenged anybody in the locker room for a fight saying that he would decimate the entire locker room, saying he's dominant, blah, 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 the usual angry Big Show. And the Usos came out. Big Show beat them in a handicap match. Then, man, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, Brodus Clay came out right after that. Had a nice long match with Big Show. It was, you know, it was much better than when they last squared off. But Big Show got the win with the KO punch. And then immediately after that, the rate Kali came out. And even that was long. And I would have to say it was probably one of the better matches that Big Show and Kali has had since they've ever faced off. But Okay, but does Kali ever have a good match? <laughs> he did against Antonio Cesaro on main event. Well, I didn't watch that match. Yeah, it was, it was actually decent to watch. But uh, before anybody came out, Big Show was, you know saying that he would decimate the entire locker room and even uh, threatened to take out The Miz, who was on commentary, his usual spot for main event. And he would he was telling him that, you know, telling him to stop laughing and blah, blah, blah. So after Big Show defeated The Usos, Brodus Clay, and Great Khali, The Miz finally had enough, ran in the ring, and kept kicking Big Show in the face, and Big Show leaves. So I guess this is what's going to happen next. For Big Show, maybe he gets in a feud with The Miz. Maybe that takes Miz away from Antonio Cesaro. Who knows? This is only the first week after Elimination Chamber. That is true. Because, I mean, you know that first week after Elimination Chamber, they like to test possible feuds going into WrestleMania. And you either see them continue or you don't see them at all. So Right. And that's a perfect segue for me because... Leading up to WrestleMania, they are testing feuds going around, just like they were testing Mark Henry against Kali during Raw. At the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view, Mark Henry was so dominant in that chamber, just as we had expected him to be. Unfortunately, he didn't win, but the guy who did win was the man that we had predicted all along, Jack Swagger. This has to be one of his biggest wins And yes, I'm including Money in the Bank at WrestleMania years ago and his subsequent world title win, which actually flopped. But Swagger won the Elimination Chamber match. And that leads us to a program for Swagger and Del Rio. Now, Mm -hmm. everything seemed to be running smoothly. On Monday Night Raw, Jack Swagger gave his State of the Union address on President's Day in Washington, convenient, and basically, <clears throat> he basically talked about immigration along with Zeb Coulter, and while I did have a problem with that kind of promo a couple of weeks ago, I think the way they finally tie everything together with Del Rio now being involved makes a lot of sense, and it, it's working beautifully. And I like, I like the feud that this is leading into just because of who is involved. And yeah. everything seemed to be running smoothly. Raw happened. Then we have the SmackDown tapings. And that's where things start to go downhill for one particular man, Jake Hager, who goes by Jack Swagger. <sighs> man, you screwed up. Okay. 
Jack, 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 Jack. They know he likes to smoke weed. Because before he took his six-month hiatus, quote-unquote, he was smoking weed every day. He was on some, I'm the Brian Kendrick, and I kind of want to get fired, but I kind of don't want to get fired at the same time. He was on that. Smoke weed all the time and get busted, pay a fine. And, I mean, they could have fired him back then. But to just get your push and then be driving under the influence, having pot in your car. And I think he was speeding, too. Yep. Yeah. Um, you kind of screwed up for you. Dutch Mantel, Alberto Del Rio, because from what I keep hearing, if that Glenn Beck fool had decided to come on Raw, Jack would have been screwed even worse than him had he not done what he did. He'd be perfectly fine. Angle would have went on, but now it's up in the air because you don't know. He might have ended up winning the world title out of this angle. He might not have, but now they're like, he's a pothead. Why put the title on him? So, basically, after the SmackDown tapings that occurred in Biloxi, Mississippi, Jack Swagger was pulled over at first for speeding. Then, he, it was determined he had a DUI, not from alcohol, but from just driving under the influence. And then, the officer had found pot, marijuana, in his car. So that's a triple threat right there, and WWE is not happy about this. Anybody who pays attention to this isn't happy about that. I mean, who does this when they're getting one of the biggest pushes of their career that's actually thrust them into a main event storyline where the company is actually talking about putting the title on you and you're speeding? Like, if you know you have this, you know, paraphernalia and you're vehicle uh wouldn't you want to stay under the radar i'm just saying you know not that you know not that i know all the details but still now there is controversy going around with this is the wwe going to punish swagger and show that their wellness policy is actually intact if they do i don't think it will be much of a problem because by the time swagger Swagger's uh, suspension would end. We would still have about a week and a half until WrestleMania, so he could come back and attack Del Rio if they so choose to go that way. Or are they going to do like they did with uh, Sin Cara when he got popped for wellness? Are they going to let him work the pay-per-view and then suspend him after? It's very all confusing. Well, in my mind, how I see it, um, because unless they change the wellness, I don't think if you get popped for having marijuana or whatever that you get suspended for it you just have to pay like just twenty five hundred dollar fine yeah but the problem with this is tmz is plastered this all over their website as as much as we should expect them to just sure. because they are a media global website that likes to expose all this stuff if it wasn't for that wwe might have kept this quiet i mean look at uh Cameron, she got pulled over and tried to bribe an officer and only got like a 15-day suspension, but I believe she only got the suspension because of TMZ, which is why I see the reason why Swagger could indeed get punished is because of all the media attention that this has received. My, I'm just, I'm just mad that it all happened because I, I'm, now, I'm more concerned and more focused on the punishment and repercussions as opposed to the actual storyline now. And that's making me mad. Yeah, I definitely get that. I agree with what Sierra said in the chat room. Just do a bunch of pre-recorded vignettes with Jack and Dutch doing their State of the Union addresses and stuff like that. And they air them on SmackDown and pretend like Jack is in training for his WrestleMania match. And just have Dutch on SmackDown and him be the go-between between between him and Del Rio leading up to it. And then when you end his suspension, you can go ahead and just have um, Jack come out, like you said, and attack Del Rio and 
make this big statement going into that SmackDown, um, that final SmackDown before WrestleMania. That would work perfectly. Now, I have a question to ask you. First of all, let me ask, are you, have you been watching TNA or at least caught up with the storyline that they have for the world title? No. All right, well, currently, TNA Wrestling has uh, Jeff Hardy as their world heavyweight champion, for those who don't know. And they recently have to go into Europe for a tour for a span of one month. Jeff Hardy cannot travel over there just because of his arrest and his uh, his, his felony record. And what they did was they made a storyline where they took him out, or the Aces and Aces took him out and injured him so that he couldn't show up on TV, so to speak. And that was their way of writing him off TV for the entire month of February since TNA is in England and the UK for all of February. Now, my thing is, should they have Del Rio attack Swagger or maybe some uh, Latino sympathizer or something attack Jack Swagger and, I mean, yeah, attack Jack Swagger and take him off TV for a month and then we have Zeb Coulter giving promos and, and have Swagger give all these YouTube videos that he, you know, in a cast or something, I'm hurt and you're one, one of your... You know, you attacked me, you hurt me, blah, blah, blah. I'm still going to WrestleMania. Do you think they should do that and and write Jack Swagger off TV so that he can get his 30-day suspension? With someone as big as Jack, I don't know if that would necessarily work. But the way that you like said like a Latino sympathizer comes in and attacks him, it might work. But I think for WWE, it might be too far-fetched for them to actually go ahead and do it. Well, maybe not as a sympathizer. Maybe Del Rio himself. Maybe uh, he attacks Swagger, gives him the cross arm breaker. We we make believe that Del Rio snapped his arm or maybe dislocated Swagger's shoulder. So Swagger has to wear a sling during his YouTube videos to sell the arm. And Swagger, you know, each week, him and Zeb Coulter get even more angrier and and aggravate you know much much angrier and more aggravated about being taken out and maybe find some way to give swagger his suspension give swagger his wrestlemania match and give swagger the title if they still decide to go that way or should they just scrap yeah. or should they should they just scrap swagger storyline altogether and replace him for wrestlemania and then go back to swagger after all is said and done it's, it's like, so hard to, like, sit there and predict what they're going to do. Because, right. like, we're coming up with, like, some pretty interesting ideas. But, you know, WWE, last minute, they always decide to change something. And it and just I- sucks that Jack got in trouble doing this right now on the verge of a huge push. Instead of while he was gone for, like, like that six months. When he was only working house shows. Exactly. And that's my gripe about it is is that it's it happens now it happens right before wrestlemania i mean look at our um rob van dam when he was in wwe he got pulled over the car found drugs and, and marijuana in his car and he had to to uh drop the wwe title on raw and then the ecw title on the next night on wwe ecw so you know they they didn't pull any punches with rob van dam they made him drop both titles and suspended him. So, as of right now, I have not heard anything about Swagger getting suspended from WWE. He has a court date in Mississippi in uh, March, and it just so happens to be during one of SmackDown's tapings. But as of, I haven't heard anything about him being suspended or anything like that. Maybe a fine? I don't know. Maybe if they find him, that might work. Oh, def- they'll definitely fine him, but I, like I said, I haven't heard anything of his punishment yet. He'll definitely get fined. I know that. He should have. Oh, yeah. So, with that being said, we do have actual SmackDown to run down, but we had to get those bits out the way, and uh, like I said, this is all so confusing, and it's taking over the actual storyline. The, the non-storyline is overtaking the storyline, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So, 
SmackDown opened with Alberto Del Rio responding to Swagger's State of Union address from Raw with his own State of Address. And he says that uh, he's going to WrestleMania. He talks about Jack's promo from Raw. And he kept saying, as a response to Swagger saying, We the people. Del Rio now says, We the immigrants. And he said, This country was built by ig- immigrants, hardworking people, chasing the American dream. He says, the Him winning the title is an example, a result of his hard work. And he, he had the best line when he said, If we the immigrants want handouts, why don't you come out here so I can lay my hand out all across your face? I popped for that. He cut a good promo to start the show. And to be in Mississippi or Missouri or wherever the hell they were, um, to get that kind of reaction was a good thing for him. But he wasn't the only one who had an issue with Jack Swagger, was he? Nope, because the man who was last eliminated in the chamber, Randy Orton, wanted a piece of Swagger. Oh, yeah. He was... And the funny thing with Randy, he was like, you know what? If I was him, I would have done the exact same thing. But I'm mad that I'm not going to WrestleMania for my World Heavyweight Championship. So, Alberto, you back up. Swagger's mine tonight. Or we can fight to see who fights him. Yeah, and at the time of the taping, of course, at the time of the taping, Randy Orton says, you have a match with Swagger at WrestleMania, but tonight is my turn. Yeah, and what did that do? It brought out our general manager, who's still rocking that stupid bun of dreadlocks, Booker T, who decides to make Randy Orton versus Jack Swagger. And in the main event, a champions versus champion match between Alberto Del Rio and our Intercontinental Champion, Wade Barrett. Two very big matches for SmackDown. Exactly. And this was a good setup by Booker T. Two good matches. Again, JBL marks out for the matches that was made. So, you know what? I do too. I mean, they're both rarely seldom seen matches. So, you know, I was excited for that to happen. Yeah. Uh, the first match of and, the night. Um, oh, go ahead. What was the first match of SmackDown? Because I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was Sheamus versus Damian Sandow, and this was a really good match. Yeah, it was. Um, now I actually do remember that. Um, it was a good match. It was very physical, very in your face. Damian Sandow turned it up to another gear because you know Sheamus is in there. He loves to fight. He loves to brawl. But Damian took it to him. And a couple times it looked close like Damian was about to pull out the victory. But ultimately, Damian fell prey to that broke kick. That very, very sick broke kick. Yeah, and Sheamus hit the white noise, the broke kick. JBL with his usual cliched line. He's been such a cliche commentator now. That don't knock out your back, cuspids. He says... Every time there's a bro kick, every time Sheamus is clubbing someone on the chest in the ropes, he's like, oh, it's time for a clubbering. I wish he'd do that to you, though. He's now become a cliche commentator, and I'm starting to get sick of it. Yeah. Uh, him and his little cliche quotes, you can find some more. Because it's about getting annoying as when Michael Cole used to say, vintage this and vintage that, and... When King always used to yell puppies. And yeah, like, just no. Yeah. Even Michael Cole has pointed it out to JBL. You become a walking cliche. That's pretty bad when you're being called out by Michael Cole. Exactly. Um, But I did like the counters in the match because how Damien kept countering the white noise and how um, Sheamus tried to counter... um, Damien's neck breaker and things like that. Like they told a good story in the match. Oh yeah. I enjoyed it. It's uh I had the WWE app open for the show and the stat popped up that Sheamus is five and O whenever he faces Sandow. So these guys need okay, to just bad. stop having matches. Yeah. Ever since Team Road Scholars have split, the these two guys have been on a down slope. It's like they're still getting reaction from the crowd because the crowd hates them. but And they have good matches consistently, but they always lose the matches. Yeah. So 
The next match was Oksana and Tamina Snuka versus Layla and Caitlin in a Divas tag team match. And hey, I'll say what you say about Oksana. She's impressing me each and every week that I'm watching her in a match. She's adding moves to her move set. She has a sidewalk slam. She, you know, she uh, does clotheslines. She does a figure four neck lock. She does a splash. I mean, she's impressing me. I mean, Oksana isn't the worst in ring competitor that they have, but she's far from the greatest. She can have good matches. Real quick, before this match, though, we had a backstage segment with Caitlin and Cody Rhodes talking about his mustache. Yeah, and I was I was actually going to jump into that a little later, but uh, that was very weird. It was weird, and it's like they're teasing turning Cody face, and I don't want them to do that, because the last time he was face, it was god-awful. Because uh-huh. he started off as a face in the company, and he lost every match. He had a feud with Randy Orton, and then he became um, Bob Holly's tag team partner, and that tag team should have never happened. So I don't want Cody to turn face again. Especially if it means he's going to be in an on-screen relationship with Caitlyn. But going back to the match, Layla and Caitlyn got the win. And I don't know if you noticed it, King J, but when the title was being passed over to Caitlyn, Layla held it a little bit too long. I predicted this months ago that they were going to turn Layla heel and her and Caitlyn were going to feud. Especially the night, the SmackDown after she won the Divas title and her, Alicia Fox... And Caitlyn were backstage, and Layla was holding the belt and staring at it like it was her precious. And then I was like, oh, here's your title. And she kind of looked at her. I knew that they were going to build something like that because, you know, Elimination Chamber, February, they tried to be nice to Caitlyn, I mean, to Tamina, and give her her one match push. And then she goes back to long range with the rest of the divas who don't matter. So they're going to siphon Layla back in. She's going to attack Caitlyn one week, and then that's going to be a WrestleMania match. And I don't know how I feel about this. Because I want to like it, because Layla's so much better as a heel, but I don't know how her and Caitlyn are going to work together. Do you think we're going to see Caitlyn versus Layla for the title at WrestleMania? (sighs) Yes. And I don't want (laughs) as much as I love Layla, and as much as I like Caitlyn, I don't want to see the two of them have a one-on-one match (laughs) at WrestleMania, because this has the potential to go really, really bad. (sighs) I don't know what to expect for that. I mean, I definitely see it going that way, but right now it's a little too soon, and with what happened backstage, I I don't know what to think for Caitlyn right now, although she's... I I guess you could say... She's getting a lot of, um, what do you call it, likes from the company because she's the Divas champion. She's in a program with Layla, possibly. She's had a backstage segment with Cody. I don't know. They're just trying to figure out what to do with her because WWE doesn't know how to book Caitlyn. They really don't. So that's, they're just. That's... So imagine Caitlyn is a big wall. They're just throwing things at. At, at the wall, at her, to see if it sticks. And most things are just falling back off. Like, they threw Tamina, Tamina fell back off. The only thing that they threw at her that actually st- stuck was the Eve storyline. Yeah. Since that, since her days on NXT, she struggled to be relevant. And then they put her in this program with Eve, and that got her some notoriety on the main roster level and then now they're just trying to figure out what to do with her and somewhat make her title reign relevant even though her title reign right now is going by Natalia's title reign nowhere but down well like I said it looks like they have a lot of well not a lot but you know some some plans for Caitlyn maybe some some people in the company like her and and want to have storylines for either way She's definitely become the talk of the divas, and especially oh, the yeah. talk, especially the talk of our uh, Angry Marks chat room right now. 
So, you know, if, if you're listening to this live and you're not in the chat room, you're missing out on a good conversation going on in there. But, yeah, uh, I mean, I hope that they figure out a way to book her well and make yeah. her title run mean something and give her some meaningful feuds. But if I look at it, the cat was worse of a wrestler than she was, and her title reign actually meant more than um, Caitlyn's does so far. So, Wow. All right. Well, um, let's move on to Zeb Coulter talking to Jack Swagger backstage, giving him some words of encouragement as Swagger gets ready for his match with Orton. But Wade Barrett pops in, and I found this to be a really interesting interaction between them. And Barrett was telling Del Rio, I'm sorry, was telling Swagger that what he says about Del Rio is, you know, wonderful. He's praising him. He says he's going to take pleasure in punishing him tonight. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. He goes on. And Zeb Coulter, I, I, I was really looking at this weird, like, all right, you have an Englishman praising these guys. I wonder what's going to happen. And just as I'm thinking that, Zeb asks Wade, you know, he says, we might have a misunderstanding because you don't talk like me. You don't look like me. Where are you from? Barrett tells him, of course, that he's from England. And Zeb just says, well, that means you too are part of the problem. So why don't we kill two birds at one stone? Why don't you and Del Rio take each other out and then both of you go back to where you came from? My jaw dropped. I was hoping that this angle that they wouldn't just focus on the faces who are internationally known and like Del Rio or Seamus or Sin Cara or Raven Serio, but they will also focus on the heels too and be like, you're not from here. I don't want to associate with you. And I like that they're doing that. And I hope that they continue to do that. And even if they have to like sit and made a tag team match, Randy Orton and Del Rio versus Jack and Wade Barrett or, him and 3MB or something like that, and Jack just walks off. He's like, I'm not teaming with someone who's not a real American and just walks off. I hope they do something like that. Yeah, and, and like you mentioned, that it wasn't just baby faces that they are xenophobes against. It, it's everybody that's not from America or not born in America. And I was really surprised to see that they actually, you know, took that route with Wade Barrett. And <laughs> they walked off, and Barrett's just staring off at them like, wow, that didn't go as well as I had predicted. Yeah, I was like, oh, where are you going? Wade is like, okay, I'm not messing with either one of them no more. Well, Swagger came out for his match against Randy Orton in a long match. That was really good. Another good match on SmackDown. Randy Orton and Swagger went back and forth. I don't think either man really had too much an advantage. Randy Orton even broke out the, the chin lock. He hasn't done that in a while since he's been a heel. Or that was the yeah. last time he, that's the last time he did it when he was a heel. Swagger does, you know, some belly to back suplexes. Randy Orton gives him a belly to back on top of the barricade. These guys just go back and forth, punch for punch, move for move, hold for hold. And then finally, Swagger sticks a thumb in Orton's eye, pulls him onto the ropes, pins him, and gets his foot on the bottom rope for three. That was just an impressive win for Jack Swagger to get over Randy Orton. And very sneaky and very heelish. And it worked, because the match didn't make Randy look weak, depending on what the hell they're going to do with him or WrestleMania, even though he doesn't really need to have a match. Um, <clears throat> it was a good match. I like the back and forth. I like the physicality. Um, I like that um, Jack ended up getting the win in a similar fashion to the way that he won at Elimination Chamber, which gives Randy like a legitimate gripe now to want to main Jack Swagger altogether. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really cool. Uh, Really good match. I enjoyed it. One of Swagger's best matches since he's been back, um, not counting the Elimination Chamber. And getting the win over Orton definitely solidifies him as a main eventer. 
you know, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to to speak of this show as if it's before, you know, what happened after the taping. I'm trying to like put that out of my mind and try to focus on the storyline. It's tough, man. Yeah, it is hard because you keep saying like, okay, this was an awesome match. I want to see how they do and all that stuff. But in the back of your mind, you're like, but he got arrested and we don't know what's going to happen. So it's like you're holding your breath. Like you want to delve into things, but you're like holding your breath because you don't want to say something. And then like they completely drop the angle or what have you. Yeah. Real quick. I want to talk about Jack Swagger and Zeb Coulter right now. And I don't know if you've heard any of this, what's going on right now, but WWE has been slandered by right-wing extremist Glenn Beck. He has been crapping on WWE, and he even called them uh, stupid wrestling people, quote-unquote. Have you seen the response from Jack Swagger and Zeb Coulter that they posted on YouTube? No, I didn't. What did they do? This is... Definitely something you need to go watch. They basically started off their promo on YouTube in character as Zeb Coulter and Jack Swagger. And they continue on with their xenophobe angle. And Mm -hmm. eventually, midway through, uh, maybe about uh, um, almost two minutes through, they break character. They break kayfabe and talk about... Um, they, and talk about Glenn Beck. You know, uh, 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 Zeb Coulter says, you know, this is Jake Hager. I am Wayne. I, I'm sorry, I forgot his whole name, Wayne. And he says, these are characters we play in the WWE. And we are currently in a storyline against Alberto Del Rio, you know, real name. Uh, Alberto Rodriguez, who is a good friend of mine. We play characters on a television show in the WWE. We we don't... These are just characters. We don't believe in this. We're not a part of a political party. We're not in it for uh, uh, the politics. These are just characters, and we don't... You know, we, we don't follow... You know, basically saying that, that they're not imitating the, the, the Tea Party... And they they respond to Glenn Beck as calling them stupid wrestling people. And he says, you know, we create these characters. You know, we have over 60 or 80 characters in the WWE, all different. And we do this for the fans, I guess, that you would call, quote-unquote, stupid wrestling fans. Now, Glenn Beck, I don't know if you realize this, but some of our fans are fans of your show. Are you calling your fans stupid fans? And he he basically goes on and basically runs him down, and he invites Glenn Beck to show up on Raw and give you know say we'll give you five minutes to explain yourself about you know why you decide to go this route talking about WWE, and he just goes on and on uh, shoot breaks kayfabe and goes on you know t- continues this, and then maybe thirty seconds before the end he says to Jake he says. All right, let's get back in character. And they continue on as Jack Swagger and Zeb Coulter and continue their character as the two xenophobes and Jack Swagger ends as we the people. And this was just a brilliant video. Just as as Randy O'RKO put it in the Ingramar chat room, but I agree. It was very brilliant, very well done, and it's sad that... Anybody in the WWE, whether it's Vince McMahon himself, or a producer, or a character, or a CEO, or a fan, has to say to somebody that, dude, this is a television show. You know, maybe maybe the actors in CSI, maybe the actors in NCIS, maybe the actors from Bones, maybe the actors from... Uh, law and order need to break kayfabe and tell people watching this hey if you know you think that we are really cops we're not we're just actors you know maybe this should happen more often so people can say hey stop getting sucked in into what you're watching stop enjoying this show we have to break kayfabe we have to give you our real names just to let you know that this is all fake 
you know, it's sad that somebody has to do that to anybody who, you know, because people want to be ignorant in this world. And that's, that's Glenn Beck. Being ignorant and calling them stupid wrestling people because of an angle, a storyline going on in the WWE. Okay, that's just, the video sounds great, and I definitely will go watch it. Um, for someone like Glenn Beck to not be able to separate reality from a television show, and that's exactly what WWE is. It's entertainment. It's a television show. For you not to be able to separate the two, you're probably like the least intelligent individual than the people that you call stupid wrestling people. Because in all honesty, most wrestling fans, teenagers to adults, they realize that what happens there is for the TV show. When you see that person out on the street, Wade Barrett isn't an uptight British asshole. Randy Orton isn't a borderline psychotic schizophrenic. Big Show isn't a seven feet tall asshole. Hornswoggle isn't a leprechaun. The Kali isn't a giant tree. Naomi and Cameron don't walk around on the street dancing with a fat pumpkin walking with them. Like, you have to be able to separate the two. Because if you honestly can't um, separate reality from fiction, then you don't need to interact with it. You don't need to acknowledge it. You just need to move on with your life. Because it's the same argument that me and Sierra have all the time when we're not on the site. Like, some wrestling fans take things too serious, where they believe what they see on TV is reality. Like, they really think, like, Kane was burned as a child and he walks around setting people on fire. Like, it's not real. And you need, and people need to realize that. So for Glenn Beck to get out of his lane and go attack something that has completely nothing to do with him in all reality, um, he needs to remove himself from the situation. And for him, because I heard that he decided to turn them down and everything, why are you so scared to go on the television show if they said that they're going to give you your lane to go and talk? Put your stuff out there. Go ahead, say what you got to say, and then they'll have a rebuttal for you in some kind of way. Let well enough alone. If you don't have, if you can't put on your big boy pants and man up, then you ain't got nothing else to say. In all honesty, I know, and it's it's people like Glenn Beck that I don't have a problem with people. Um, uh, there I know there are going to be people in there that believe wrestling is real and and the characters that are real, but if you have a national tv show that people watch then you might want to be privy to what the hell's going on before you bash it saying you know that you know the guys involved in the angle are stupid wrestling people um they're just real people i mean are we gonna does the undertaker need to break kayfabe and say you know in the in the middle of the ring say hey guys i'm really not an undertaker I ride motorcycles for a living, and my name is Mark Calloway. I don't really tombstone people on their heads. I, I play it safe, and I'm being careful. No, it's a character. You don't expect exactly. to see. You don't expect to see anybody in a, a horror movie suddenly take off their their horror mask and say, "Yeah, uh, I'm John Smith. Uh, I'm not really a serial killer, but you know, I'm I'm just pretending because I'm only acting." Give it up. Exactly. Jeez, and and go figure, Glenn Beck has refused to show up on Raw, saying he has other important things to do other than that. Okay, but you weren't too busy to make comments in the first place. Exactly. So obviously you weren't too busy um, because he works at Fox News, right? Something like that. I don't really pay attention or care about that. I, I just saw that scroll across my news feed, and I got tagged to watch the video. I saw it. And I instantly loved uh, the Swagger character even more. Yeah. Just, just the fact that they had to break kayfabe for some right-wing asshole. And that's the sad thing. Like People like him make their whole party's agenda and everything look like a bunch of assholes. Because one person has to step out of his lane and go attack other people for no reason. Right. And this isn't me dissing... 
right-wing assholes. No, I'm just dissing that right-wing asshole. Exactly. So, so, now that I got that rant done and out the way, let's get back to SmackDown, because there's other important things other than him to discuss. <sighs> Moving on, we get a look at Wade Barrett's new movie, Dead Man Down, which, honestly, I think looks interesting. Uh, I don't know the timetable of when I'll watch it. Most likely not in the theaters, but I might. You never know if there's nothing else I want to see. But it is something I do want to watch, even if it, you know, even if I have to wait till it comes out on DVD or HBO, whatever have you. But after the preview, Matt Stryker interviews Wade Barrett, except Seamus interrupts, much like he interrupted Wade Barrett on Monday Night Raw, and tell me that wasn't awkward right there. Oh, oh my God, that was geez. the most awkward thing. <laughs> yeah, that was just very random for Seamus to pop out. And and just like uh, Killer Kev was saying on the Raw reaction with Quintastic One, the returning Quintastic One, it's so good to hear his voice again. Um, Killer Kev made the statement of to, for Seamus, you know, shouldn't you be getting ready for your fight or your match with the Shield, which was... Awesome, in my opinion. On SmackDown, Sheamus showed up, interrupted Wade Barrett's interview, and does an impression of Wade Barrett's role, and just stands there. Wade Barrett, though, finally had a great comeback, even though he was very, you know, he's left very speechless on Raw. Barrett said, uh, Do you think that was funny? Much like you losing to the Shield two nights in a row? That was a great comeback for Wade Barrett. Yeah, it was. Do you think that they're going to make a program between Wade and Sheamus for WrestleMania? Since, right, this, you know, like, we've completely forgot that Bo Dallas exists. All right, this is where everything gets all crazy. Sheamus shows up to interrupt Wade Barrett on Raw, shows up to interrupt Wade Barrett on SmackDown, and all the while, we're all of a sudden supposed to forget about Wade Barrett's feud with Bo Dallas. Now... Back before the Royal Rumble, there were plans for an Intercontinental Cup on WWE Main Event, where it was going to be a tournament of challengers to be the next contender for Wade Barrett's Intercontinental Championship. Now, that's been scrapped due to Bo Dallas having such a you know hot feud with Wade Barrett at the Royal Rumble and Raw the next night. And then all of a sudden, we get weeks where we don't see Bo... Then we see Bo, Wade Barrett attacks him, then we don't see him, then Bo Dallas attacks Wade Barrett, and then there's no follow-up off of that. Like, what happened here? And and what I think was, WWE writers, or Vince McMahon himself, probably figures that for WrestleMania, we need a high-profile match, and Bo Dallas isn't going to cut it. And I'm sure that probably makes Killer Kev happy, since he says that will be past Bo Dallas's bedtime slash curfew but i honestly think that they're going with wade barrett versus sheamus for the intercontinental title at wrestlemania not that we need those two to feud again because honestly i've had enough for a couple of months after these guys have faced each other on raw smackdown smackdown main event raw main event smackdown raw i don't know that's just me I mean, I enjoy watching Wade Barrett and Sheamus, and I know I always say, like, I used to watch their stuff over in Ireland and England and all that crap. But why not let Bo and Wade just feud? Keep, y'all could have kept that feud going. They could have kept attacking each other, had, like, a um, no whole bar match or something, and let that go. Um, him and Sheamus, they work well together, but... Do we really need to have that match at WrestleMania? Especially because um, Wade's the Intercontinental Champion. Are we demoting Sheamus back down to the Intercontinental Championship? Wrong of things? Or is he just the guy who you just throw at people when they have nothing to do? Like Damian well, Sandow. I was enjoying this feud with Bo Dallas because it's new. It's fresh. We We didn't have the same guys fighting over and over again. I was I was actually enjoying it, and for them to just randomly drop it, I, okay, I understand that some people don't know Bo or don't care about Bo Dallas, 
But it's new. It's fresh. It's something we haven't seen before. And I feel like we've seen Wade Barrett versus Sheamus for the past five months, ever since Wade Barrett has returned over and over again. Yeah. Unless there's, like, something big on the line between Wade and Sheamus, they don't really need to have a match. If but, like, I, mean, I don't know. Like, they had a lot of potential to do the Wade versus Bo, get the kid over, so he gets, like, a huge reaction. Because he was getting a reaction. Then he stopped having matches. Then he was backstage with the Divas and got attacked. And then... We didn't see him for like a week, and then he attacked Wade, and then we didn't see either one of them. And it's like, what are you doing with Wade Barrett? He's an Intercontinental Champion, and he's not defending the title. He has nobody really pursuing him. It's like, what are you doing? Figure something out. Yeah, I mean, I was actually starting to enjoy it because we see this young kid getting the upper hand on Wade Barrett, Wade Barrett gets his retaliation with a sneak attack. Bo Dallas gets his retaliation with a sneak attack. I mean, this was actually interesting. It wasn't your typical, hey, I hate you, I hate you, let's fight. You know, hey, you have a title, I'm the champion, let's fight. You know, Wade Barrett is like, I'm going to embarrass this kid, and I get embarrassed. And then Bo Dallas is like, yeah, I embarrassed him, and then I get my ass kicked. You know, it was it was something different. It was like a real feud. Instead, we yeah. have instead now we have Sheamus and Wade Barrett talking about a movie and someone making fun of him. Don't make fun of me. Oh, that's not funny. Okay, let's have a match for your title. What? We get that, and then we don't get to see Bo, but we keep getting to see Johnny Curtis as a creepy dancer with his little molesty self. Like, no, I don't need. Let Johnny Curtis just be Johnny Curtis off of NXT. And let him stay there for the rest of his career. Because nobody needs him. Ever. Like give Bo Dallas like some promo time. Like show what the hell he was doing down at NXT. Hype the kid up. We don't want to see Johnny Curtis. Nobody wants to see him. No one's going to give him a reaction. Because nobody cares about him. I don't know. I'm not happy with getting Barrett and Sheamus again. Starting from a movie. Starting from making fun of him playing a role in a movie like that that's not that's not how i want to see a feud started especially when the champion is involved exactly and sierra posed a great question it's black history month where the hell is justin gabriel he got his ass kicked by jack swagger a couple of weeks ago on smackdown and okay, speaking they could of- find him again because i mean they found our truth to be the black history month recipient as well kofi kingston again yeah, and and I had made this joke on uh, during Raw in the Anger Marks chat room. Um, we don't need Kofi and Truth to team up again. They had their Black History Month last year, and, and I think this year it would be the year of Titus O'Neil. Last time we saw Justin Gabriel, he was on main event against Titus O'Neil. Actually, this week on main event, Darren Young will not be seen for about eight months because he has a leg injury titus o'neill they're probably gonna have to find something to do with him some more solo matches he's been having solo matches lately i mean he had a match with a great colleague a couple weeks ago on smackdown he had a one-on-one match against justin gabriel on main event and titus o'neill i'm sorry i would not have said this when he was in nxt or debuted on smackdown titus o'neill is a character he is great right now. He has progressed so much since he has debuted on SmackDown. So much since he's been teaming with Darren Young and getting TV time. Titus O'Neil, during his match with Justin Gabriel on main event, he was jawjacking with the fans most of the time during most of the match. Most importantly to uh, Rick the Sign Guy, who was in the crowd in the front row, I mean, Titus O'Neil is just, he's just turned it up a notch, and he's gotten so intense lately. He's going to have a big role in 2013, I can just see it. The funny thing with Titus is he was horrible on um, <laughs> really Sierra, My Little Pony. <laughs> <laughs> um, his first season in NXT, he was god-awful. And then when they did NXT Redemption, 
he had a feud with um, Darren Young. They hated each other. And that turned him up to another notch because he was learning how to cut good promos and stuff. Then he turned on Percy Watson and started teaming with Darren Young. And they started their whole little thing. Then they got signed to SmackDown. They were primetime players. They were doing big things. Then they kind of fell off a little bit. Then they got back on. Then they fell off again. Now, um, Darren's out hurt. This is Titus's time to keep that momentum going and see how he can do in a solo run. And, I mean, the barking, it irks me like no other. But he works, like. His whole thing with the whistle, with the whistle, the you ain't got no cuts and all that stuff, it works because it's really him. You know what it is with uh, Titus O'Neil and his barking? It annoyed the crap out of me during NXT. It has annoyed me when he's debuted on SmackDown. But now that he's developed such this heel persona and always jawing with the fans, always talking trash to his opponent talking trash to whoever's on the apron in the tag match, and then he does his bark. He does it so obnoxiously and so cocky that it works, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, no, I it hated it. Does. I hated it at first, but now when he, when he, when he, you know, looks straight at the fans, talks trash, oh, yeah, I don't make me come out there and hurt you, and then he does his bark, it, is, it actually works like that. Oh, yeah, it does. I mean... He's come up such a long way, and hopefully they continue to build something with him. Um, but yeah, they have a lot of people on that roster who are good that they don't push, like the Usos. Because I remember earlier you said that they were on main event this week with Big Show. But they're not on TV, and they get reactions. I don't understand. Yeah. But to uh, bring everything back and to... Uh segue this from WWE main event and like I mentioned before with The Miz getting into a a scuffle with Big Show does this mean he's done with Antonio Cesaro because on Monday Night Raw he defeated Cesaro in a non-title no disqualification match but yet he had a beef with Big Show on main event, and then fast forward to SmackDown, he has a third match in two weeks against Cody Rhodes, and we mentioned this earlier, Cody Rhodes, I don't know if you could call it a face turn, I kind of saw it, because they were talking about his uh, interaction with Caitlyn on the active, and saying the ladies call it a love stash, he even gave pre-match comments saying that He's tired of the criticism about him donning a mustache. It's not just a mustache. It's a love stash. Like, what the f- Really? A love stash? So, the only <laughs> There's only two people who love his mustache. Well, actually three. Besides himself, it's his fiance Brandy Reed, formerly known as Eden Styles, for her frizzy hair. And um, Caitlyn, because Caitlyn likes mustaches because she's awkward like that. Well, don't forget his very best friend, Damien Sandow. Damien can take his googly eye self and go read a book. <laughs> well, we mentioned, uh, speaking of Damien Sandow, he's, you know, 0 for 5 against Sheamus. Cody Rhodes, since being solo, he lost another match. The Miz defeated him with the figure four leg lock. I think Cody is now, what, 1 for 7 now? Just in in singles matches, like what are they gonna do with him? Please reunite Team Road Scholars permanently. They were winning more. Yeah, they were actually winning matches. They were bulked. Now Cody just comes to the ring, complains about his mustache, and gets hit with a figure four leg lock. <sighs> figure four leg lock, and apparently they've dropped the uh, Miz is Ric Flair's protege angle and you know thankfully but you know Miz has just added the figure four leg lock to his arsenal so I don't know I guess that this was really a nothing match it didn't suck it was very fast paced it was hard to keep up in my opinion but uh it was just an excuse for Miz to get the win he's still bandaged up Cody loses again I wasn't happy about this whole match okay so the Miz has like 
two possible feuds going, the one with Cesaro, the one with Big Show, and then he just beats up Cody when Cody has a match. That's pretty much what The Miz is doing. Pretty much. Cody is still has his BFF that he's no longer tag teaming with. He has a mustache, a horrible win-loss record, and a possible love angle with Caitlyn. And the yeah. last time she was in a relationship, it was with Derek Bateman on NXT Season 5. And that, and that was awkward in of itself. And Johnny Curtis kept trying to get her in his van with a carpet in it. And Cody doesn't need a love angle. He just needs to have good matches and get a push somewhere. Speaking of Johnny Curtis, when the hell are we going to get over these damn Fandango promos? Okay, is it me, or does he look like a creepy child molester? He always does. I mean, he always has, but with the little hair thing, and then he's, like, dancing, and then he's like, fine, da, go, no, fandang, no, fandang, no, fandang, no. Just call yourself Johnny Curtis and molest the Titantron like you were on NXT. And better yet, just don't let me see you. Sit in your creepy van in the parking lot. And try and pick people up. That's all you need to do with your life. <laughs> all I remember is seeing a comment made by uh, our very own boss, DVJ. He says, if this Fandango gimmick is supposed to be about dancing or ballroom dancing, why does he look so stiff when he's doing the dance moves? He needs to get some lessons from Chris Jericho. Mm. <laughs> So that takes us to the main event of SmackDown, a champion versus champion non-title match. Wade Barrett versus Alberto Del Rio. And this was another great match. SmackDown was filled with them. Yes. Main event quality. Barrett versus Del Rio was awesome. One of the best matches I've seen on SmackDown in all of 2013 so far to this date. It was really good. I mean, Del Rio, I think, has come a long way to being a babyface. He's definitely solidified as such. He's got the crowd on his side. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what any other podcast says. Del Rio is getting a great reaction as a babyface. He is. He's getting a great reaction, and he's a good champion. Like, there's, I've had no reason thus far to complain about his title reign, his face push, nothing. Del Rio has... Have you seen his comeback moves? You know, have you noticed it's very similar to Randy Orton? I mean, but look how long he had to fight Randy Orton. So, of course, <laughs> he was going to learn how to do comebacks like him. Because, <laughs> I mean, you can only get hit by, like, a thousand clotheslines per match by Randy Orton every time he has a comeback because he has, like, two comebacks in every match that you like, okay, I'll start clotheslining people, too. But he does a tilt world backbreaker, which I like. And when he did that to Wade Barrett, that was a mark-out moment. I, 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 look, Wade Barrett is bigger than Del Rio. So to see yes. that, on him, that was pretty pretty incredible. Jack Swagger was standing on the stage during the entire match. He came out before the match started. Him and Zeb Coulter, of course. Del Rio, you know, he makes his comeback. He he now, and I guess you can make the same argument for the fact that Del Rio has faced Sheamus so many times that he's adopted what he does. You know, he traps them in the ropes and he forearm, gives them forearm smashes to the kidneys, you know, where Sheamus clubbing blows to the chest. No, now Del Rio does forearm smashes to the kidneys and uh, finishes with a double knee backbreaker, a.k.a. the backstabber, backcracker, or whatever you want to call it. Lung blower. Either way. <laughs> it works. I mean, when you face somebody so many times, of course you're going to incorporate some of their stuff into your repertoire, and it works. And it helps him as a face show aggression without looking too heelish at the same time yeah and i mean if you think about it and just to 
make, just to make a comment in the chat room from Randy O R K O. He said he saw that with Del Rio and was wondering, is this Del Rio or Sheamus? But if you think about it, when Sheamus does it, and now when Del Rio does it, it works, like you said, because they're baby faces. The crowd gets to count with them in every blow. So that's why yeah. you see the baby faces doing stuff like this more often, more than the heels. Because, I mean, if the heels do it, the crowd's still going to count, and, you know, you're getting the heel over, and that's not what they want to do. But when the baby face does it, it's one, two, three, the crowd is involved, which is what I like to see. The crowd is involved, you know, they're counting along when he's delivering those shots. When Del Rio uh, pounds his, his fist and stomps the mat before the super kick or before the enziguri, the crowd is stomping along when del rio is slapping his his wrist going see see the crowd is chanting along it's crowd participation that's what i like to see and as long as you're getting some form of reaction you're doing your job exactly and that's why that's why i'm liking del rio as a baby face he's really playing it up well he's getting the crowd involved He's getting them chanting, you know, he's, that's what, that's what it's all about. You know, you're doing this for the fans, get them involved. You know, I want to see more heels like Titus O'Neil that we mentioned, shouting at the fans, getting them to boo him so that they're not just sitting on their hands watching this, the match or whatever is going on silently. Get them involved, get them cheering for you, get them booing you. It's crowd participation 101. Yeah. Because, I mean, even Wade Barrett does it in a different manner, but he still, like, he goes out there and they just boo him out of the building. Partially because he's a foreigner, partially because he's a douche, partially because they can't probably understand a word that he's saying. (laughs) But he gets a reaction. Like, even to 3MB and how gaudy that they are, they get a reaction. I ain't real sure what kind of reaction they get, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they still get a reaction. Hey, so and like the like they always say, whether it's good or bad or mixed, any reaction is better than no reaction. Yeah, aka half the time when some of the divas come out for a match and the crowd is just sitting there like, uh, <sighs> it's you. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if I've mentioned this, but Del Rio gets the win with the cross arm breaker and. Towards the end, Jack Swagger was walking to the ring or stomping to the ring. I couldn't tell. But he was shouting, we the people, we the people. But Del Rio still got the win. Swagger was not happy. And I even put this in my recap that Swagger wasn't happy. Del Rio got the win. Maybe that's why he decided to uh, take a load off later that night. (laughs) You really went there. <laughs> I did. It, I, like I said, it's hard to ignore. But yeah, at least it I, is. But at least I waited till the end for that, okay? <laughs> True. Um, real quick, what do you think about Jack Swagger's new theme music? I don't know. I, every time it starts playing, I'm still thinking, who is this? And Oh, yeah, it's Jack Swagger's new theme song. But... It works because he's needed a new theme song ever since he debuted because he's had that for the entire his entire career in WWE. Yeah, because at first when I hear it, I think of Johnny Curtis. I mean, not Johnny Curtis, John Laurinaitis. Yeah, and the People Power. Every every time I hear it, I'm like, why are they bringing Johnny Laurinaitis back? I do not need to see Johnny Ace, and then I see Jack Swagger coming. I'm like, oh, it's you. We the people power. Oh God. Um. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> we you know, What did you think about Mark else. Henry? <laughs> Mark Mark Henry is awesome because he wasn't on Smack because he wasn't on SmackDown again. He wasn't on SmackDown this week either. But on Raw, they teased the potential of him versus the Tree. And I'll say I'll say this about Mark Henry. If they do indeed decide to take Swagger out of the world title picture and rewrite the story, put Mark Henry in there. 
there was a rumor that they were going to um, have Jack and Dolph face off, and Dolph was going to win the um, right to face Del Rio at WrestleMania. No. Plus, plus have his money in the bank, and I'm like, that makes no sense, right. especially the way that you've been booking him. I'm like, just I think the best way to do it is if they're going to suspend him or anything, have him and Zeb be like, as long as WWE caters to this whole, um, all the immigrants and everything, we're not coming back. And then like the them like releasing videos on YouTube and they play them on Raw and they play them on play a different one on SmackDown and do things like that. And then like that SmackDown before WrestleMania. Jack just comes out and lays um, Del Rio out and be like, we, the people, will reclaim this country at WrestleMania or what have you and set it up that way. I think that might be an interesting way to have him off TV for however long you want to have his suspension and it works. Yeah, like it is very, very convoluted right now. Very hard to predict for me on... Like I said, since no punishment has yet to be announced for Jack Swagger, I honestly don't know hmm. what to think at this point. And I have one other question. Um, me and Sarah were talking and said that, do you think the Zeb Coulter, um, Jack Swagger, Xenophobe angle, that they should induct more people and kind of make this like a stable or should it just still be the two of them? That's also something I really can't, put any prediction on i mean i like zeb coulter being with jack swagger at this point um yeah honestly i don't see anybody else right now on the roster to join them and to have the same thoughts or sympathizers or what have you like i just see jack swagger in that role and unfortunately he's you know in in this kind of hot water so I don't know, man. I don't know. It's it's very well, hopefully, difficult. Hopefully come Monday, we'll have more information and know after Monday Night Raw what they plan on doing with this whole thing and how they're going to keep approaching it because right now it's so up in the air and we can only speculate. Yeah. Speaking of Monday Night Raw, now I, we only talk about Raw when it comes to you know, mostly when it comes to our storylines for SmackDown and, and everything involved in such with SmackDown, the world title, or, or its superstars. But I want to ask you, John Cena and CM Punk are going to face off in a one-on-one match for the right to face The Rock for the WWE title at WrestleMania. That match will happen this Monday Night Raw in two days. Who do you think is going over, and do you think it will be a clean finish or lead to some other storyline for the WWE title at WrestleMania. In a logical sense, it probably will have a clusterfuck finish and someone's going to interfere and, or a double disqualification. Then they'll have a triple threat match going into WrestleMania. That way they can protect whoever they want to from taking a pin at mania. But ideally have just have John Cena win and him go on the face, him at WrestleMania, and then you go ahead and try and figure out. You could maybe Weasel fill in there if Undertaker is all up in his emotions and wants to stay home like he needs to. I don't know. It's so up in the air. Like it's, I'd be fine with the triple threat match, but at the same time, I'm perfectly fine with just John Cena versus The Rock. Now, you know, we mentioned, we talked about this a little bit last week during the uh, Elimination Chamber preview show, and I'm going to stick by my guns. This needs to be a triple threat at WrestleMania because I just see, we originally had John Cena win the Royal Rumble, The Rock wins the WWE title, but I still see um, CM Punk inserting himself into the title match um it it only makes sense because the rock is wwe champion but he really should lose the title at mania and we all know that cm punk is going to i mean uh, i'm sorry cena is going to win the title he has to it's it's inevitable i just see i don't i see some sort of schmoz finish some clusterfuck 
to end that that match on Raw. Yeah. Um, do you think that because you know Vince and Paul Heyman are having their fight, we know that Brock Lesnar is going to pop up during that. Do you think either he or the Shield will become a factor in the John Cena versus um, CM Punk match? Um, I don't think so, but it's possible. And maybe the Shield interfere, and that's how we lead to an indecision for that match, and that leads to a triple threat. It's quite possible. Yeah. Now, I got one more question to ask you, and everybody on this Angry Marks podcast network has had their chance to give their thoughts and opinions. I now ask you, King J, how do you feel about the new design of the WWE Championship? Honestly, Honestly, I have, like, really no opinion on it. Like, it's weird, like, because they were speculating on what the new champion was going to look like for so long, and then I I was used to the ugly spinner championship. Um, This one I'm fine with, because, I mean, it's simple, it's straight to the point. It says big WWE, and then you have two side plates. Maybe per um, whoever wants the title, they change the side plates. But... I mean, at the end of the day, it's a championship, and we're all talking about it, and, like, oh, my God, it's ugly, or, oh, my God, it's great, but, like, uh, um, six months from now, nobody's going to care what the hell the championship looked like, because people were all up in arms about, people love the John Cena spinner title for, um, like, the first couple months, and then all of a sudden, they started hating it, because they're like, it's John Cena's belt. But in between that, we had the Edge Championship our belt, and then when we got the WWE Championship back, people were all fine with it, and then over time, they started hating it, because they're like, it defined an era. Well, we're in a new era, so just let the championship be the championship. Because at the end of the day, most of the time, people forget, don't really care about the championship, they care about the team that's around the championship. Hmm. Now, see, I I have mixed feelings about the new championship. I, mm-hmm. I I had no problem when it came out as the Sprinter Belt, and like The Rock said, it worked at the time. It you know for for being how it was, you know, especially with who debuted with it. You know, it debuted with John Cena. It worked. I liked the Spinner Belt because. You know that that was that was basically in then. Um, right. Now, all right. I don't like how plain it looks for the centerpiece. Um, it's just plain black. I would have preferred some. I don't know. I, I the reason why I like the spinner belt not because of the spin, but because of the gold background. It was solid gold. And this one, it's like a black background. It's just plain bl- plain black with gold and uh, diamond W in the center. I just, I, I just don't like the centerpiece. And the red line under the W is it, just dots. Ruby dots. And that's, you know, I'm not used to the W, the scratch logo being diamonds and dots. Used to the solid red. I don't know. This is minor minor nitpicks with me. I don't know why, but another problem I have is there's no nameplate. So what does that mean? Does that mean because right now on TV the side plates have a Brahma bull representing the Rock, but I I, I don't know if you've seen it, King J, but I posted a link in the chat room for the the title belt, the replica belt that they're selling on WWEshop.com, and it has. The actual WWE logo as the side plates. And I like that design. But what does that mean for future champions if The Rock has a Brahma belt as the side plates? Are future superstars going to have their own design? I mean, Sheamus had a little fun on his uh, Twitter 
and posted a picture of the title belt. But for him, he put a clover as the side plate. Are we going to get this with every champion? Because if not, I won't like that. I, like, I mean, they, I like nameplates. I think that if they do the little accents on the side plates with the um the person's logo, like they could do, for John Cena, it'd be easy for Sam Punk. It would be the two arms crossed or whatever the hell the hell wants because we all know Phil is crazy. Sheamus could have a little Celtic cross. Um, I mean, I'm personally fine with it because. You remember back in the day, they had the Smoking Skull belt, the Brahma Bull belts, um, and all those different things. So for me, the belt looks more official because it has the big WWE and it says champion. So like if they're on a talk show, you don't have to look through all the gaudy gold and everything. Like say the World Heavyweight Champion was on a talk show. Um, you have that big classic belt that you can't tell what the hell that is. You just know it's big and it's made out of gold. With this, you see the WWE, and then you see champion. So you know, oh, he's a wrestling champion. So, I mean, for me, that works. I don't know. Now, I'm, I'm just, I, I guess you could call me a mark for the center nameplate. Yeah. That, that's just I mean, me. I mean, it's weird that the belt doesn't actually have a nameplate, but if they are going the route of the two um, side panels are going to be interchangeable depending on the champion, if they're worthy enough to have side plates. <laughs> Cause you know, some of the people, if they get a championship, what are they going to do? Like if Cody Rhodes was WWE champion, what side places are you putting on <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, that, that's a good point. And I, and I want to point out what Sierra commented in the chat room, uh, the belt, you know, when each superstar, has their own side plate. It's dignified as their own belt. They can put their own brand on it. And I agree with that completely. But, you know, you just brought up when you have guys who have no type of brand, what do they do then? I mean, you look I at... I mean, Randy technically, technically, Cody does have a logo. Sorry to cut you off. He has a C and an R with, like, these, like, arrows because they're on, like, the side of his trunks or whatever. But... Like what you were gonna say, Randy Orton? Are you gonna put a snake on there? You know, it, that's that's the thing. Like Randy Orton, they're gonna put uh, vipers on the side plates. And Cena, you're gonna have probably the the hustle, loyalty, and respect three fingers up sign on the side plates. CM Punk, well, he's, he's probably gonna have the stars as side plates. Sheamus, we mentioned, would have a a a clover on the side. What about Big Show? What you know? What's his? A grizzly bear? You know what's what's Del Rio? Yeah. A, scar a scarf? I mean no. for Del for Del Rio it can work. Um because he has that like eagle or whatever type of bird that is on his logo on the side of his trunks, or they could do a big A. So what does this mean then? Does this mean each superstar now has to have a logo or design? I mean, yeah, because like you have your t shirts and you're moving merchandise. So if your championship belt has your things that's more merch that you're selling if like they're like oh well randy orton's a champion maybe they'll make randy orton side plates that i can put on my belt and be all cool and be like the viper or whatever like i'm just thinking like merchandise wise and then also for the um champions when they become champion like sierra was saying it becomes their belt when they have their logos instead of with the John Cena's version of the championship, no matter who had it, you associated that belt with John Cena. And I think that was one of people's biggest gripes is that, well, it's John Cena's belt, blah, blah, blah. He brought it in to define an era, so it was the era that he was really relevant and was moving merch like no other. So, I mean, it worked. Like, if Brodus Clay was champion they put like a dinosaur print on the side of the belt god knows he just never needs to be wwe championship but i'm just saying all right well like some people have logos but we just don't realize because we don't pay attention yeah and and reading the comments in the anger marks chat room it's it's making me it's you know i'm starting to see the light when it comes to 
everybody that you don't even realize has a logo, even in a t-shirt, on their trunks. You just, I guess you just really have to notice it. I mean, I, I guess one would have to really search to find out what Wade Barrett's logo is. And Wade Barrett it's a, it's a heart. <laughs> I mean, not a heart, but a um, rose. Maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's the rose. Yeah, I mean, Kofi Kingston has a wild cat on his trunks and, you know. He does. I, I guess that argument can be made that, you know, for the side plates, it, it's interchangeable. Like I said, it, it's something that I wasn't immediately enthralled about. I wasn't marking out for it. I was marking out that they were unveiling the new belt. I don't know. It, I f- felt underwhelmed at the time. I don't know. Like, like I said, I've I've always been used to the nameplates. And hell, even a lot of titles in the WWE currently don't have a nameplate on them. Like, look at the uh, Intercontinental title, the tag team titles. So, I guess... I guess the the age of the nameplate is fading away. I mean, even the Diva title doesn't have a nameplate, as gaudy as that thing looks. <laughs> I thought it did. I don't think it does. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, well, like I like I, I said know. when I when I posted on the uh, in the chat room. Actually, I'm looking at the Diva's title on on uh, online right now, and it does have a nameplate on there. Oh, uh, but I don't but, pay that close attention to the title. <laughs> Well, it's so. it's not exactly in front of the camera that often, anyways. But True. going back to my original thought, um, like I said, I I like the WWE side plates. I like the way that looks. Like the the, the design of it is actually pretty cool. But I guess you know this is how it's how it's gonna be from here on. You know, my favorite WWE championship is the undisputed title belt. It still had the winged eagle. It was very simple. It had the world, the globe right in the center. It had the WWE logo on the top. And it was distinguished as a WWE championship belt. The undisputed title is probably my favorite WWE championship from, you know, just in general. Mm -hmm. But this new one, it's going to take some getting used to. And I've heard that a lot from uh, several other people saying that, you know, it's something they need to sleep on it. You know, it's... Something I've been sleeping on ever since Monday, six days ago, and I'm still a little on the fence about it. Because I remember seeing it on Raw when um, The Rock unveiled the title. And I was like, oh. And then I went back to doing what I was doing. Like, it was, wasn't was even, like, a big deal to me. Yeah. I'm like, new championship, okay. But I, I will say CM Punk made me laugh when he attacked John Cena from behind with the old title, threw it down, pointed at The Rock, and said... I want that one. That actually made me pop. <laughs> because it sounds like because it sounds like somebody I know would say that same exact thing the same exact way. I want that one. That was pretty funny for me. One last thing before we go. Did you notice the crowd when The Rock unveiled it? You know, they they had the drum roll, The Rock unveiled the title, and the crowd was mild. Yeah, they were like just sitting there like, like yeah they, they were okay. anticipating like oh he's gonna unveil the new belt here it comes it's released it's yay and because it was like an anticlimactic thing <laughs> <laughs> and did you like the rock he just stood there and was reading the crowd and he was he's like uh not the reaction i was expecting and then he, you know, he waited. He gave them time to soak it in, and he just stood there waiting for them to actually, you know, make a reaction. And before he spoke, the crowd started chanting his name, Rocky, Rocky. So then he finally smiled and like, okay, I have a reaction now. And then he says, judging by that reaction, you like the title. And the crowd's like, yay, I guess we like it. Judging, no, I, I can't hear you. You like the title. Yay, we're cheering louder because we like you, Rocky. No, no, I can't hear you. You like The Rock's new title. Okay, Rock, we like the title. We're cheering loud. And that's how it came across to me. You know what it really was? They were like, okay, we're just going to cheer. So he'll shut up, move on, so we can go home. Because <laughs> they were overall by that point. That's yeah. what it was. I don't Cause think it's high. Because after they saw Brad Maddox, they were like, okay, Brawl's over. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they uh, were 
cheering over the new title as much as they were cheering The Rock interacting with them. I don't know. That's just my yeah. take on it. <laughs> that's but, what uh, it was. <laughs> yeah, it, that's just how it came across because like the the crowd was really silent and The Rock was befuddled. Like, um, I wasn't expecting this. I expected them to cheer loud. So he had to rile them up to, I don't know, whatever. Uh, that's all I can really say and come up with. Is there anything else you want to bring up before we head on out of here? No. SmackDown was good overall. I hope that they continue on a good roll. Uh, I want, if Layla is in fact facing Caitlyn for the Divas title, I want her to dye her hair back black and take the rest of that weave out of her hair because her hair weighs more than she does, and that's the issue. I want to see Mark Henry make fun of the Great Kali some more. <laughs> that was awesome. out. It was. <laughs> Mark, like, Henry, Mark Henry imitating the Kali dance was priceless. He's like, raise the root. Man, screw you. He's like, all you all you good to do was dance. Just sit there and dance. He said, if I want to dance, I'll go to a club. Exactly. Hopefully they figure out what to do with um, Jack Swagger and that whole situation. Mm. Let, let Kane and Daniel Bryan set each other on fire. The one who can stand the flames the longest, they get to move on with their lives. The other one just goes to hell or wherever they're from. Um, real, quick, and, oh. real, real quick, now that the uh, Road Scholars have broken up and primetime players have to, you know, Titus O'Neil has to go solo because Darren Young is out, who would take the titles away from Team Hell No? Um, Team Mucha Lucha. Ah, good one. Because, I mean, we ain't seen the Usos a month since Sunday. Um, they were actually on WWE Active last night. And on main like event. Don't, don't forget, they're on main event against Big Show. Like I said, I haven't seen them a month since Sunday. <laughs> um, Tyson's out hurt, so Justin has no tag team partner. They know what the tag teams. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, like, like we said, SmackDown was a good show. Definitely one to check out to watch. Uh, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. Even all the matches, the Divas tag match, the Miz Cody match, they were good. They weren't, you know, they weren't the best, but obviously it kept the show going. They had stories. They continued things. It all made sense. SmackDown was a good episode to go watch, and it might be a last good swagger match you will see in probably a month if they go that route. <laughs> <laughs> So, with that being said, I believe that's going to do it for this week's edition of the SmackDown Rundown. For producer Killer Kev, for my co-host King Jay, we will see you next week. Good night, everybody.